Good morning, friends in Christ. It is Friday morning, and we are glad that you're joining us on this beautiful Friday morning that the Lord has made. We rejoice and we're glad in it as we have the opportunity on this beautiful Friday morning to get into the Word of God. And so go ahead and take out your Bibles this morning and open them up to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. When you get there, you can go ahead and hit the share button as we continue to build believers to reach out and connect people to Jesus. It is Friday morning, and for many in our community, it is the last day of school. And so after today, many people, summer time starts. And so for many in our community, it's their last day of school. And so we want to thank principals and teachers and parents and children uh, for a wonderful school year, a challenging school year after the COVID and the aftermath of that. Um, and uh, But a huge thank you to all who make education possible. And so for many, it's their last day of school. And it is Friday, and we are in getting into the Word of God, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. It's important for us to remember that this is a letter written by the Apostle John, who was the disciple whom Jesus loved, a very close friend, an intimate friend of Jesus, one who knew Jesus well. And the numbers and the verses were added later to make it easier for us to be able to study the Bible and to understand the context. And as we focus on 1 John chapter 3, it's important that we look at the last couple verses of 1 John chapter 2 and the context of children of God, because that's who we are. And that's going to be the context for us today in 1 John chapter 3, that we as followers of Jesus, we as the church, the body of Christ, it is important for us to remember each and every day that we are alive and breathing, that we are children of God, whether going through good times, bad times, or on an emotional roller coaster, wherever we are at today, it's important to be reminded that we are children of God. We are loved, we are redeemed, and that God loves us. And that's what we're going to see today in 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. I'm using an ESV version of the Bible, uh, that translation today. It says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. And so God first loved us, and that's why He promised a Savior in Jesus. God first loved us, that's why He sent us a Savior, Jesus, to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves, die on the cross. And on the cross, we see His great love. And because He loves us, and because He has declared that we are children of God, it's not something that we do, it's a declared status because of what He has done for us. And He gives us that objective truth that we are children of God. Now, subjectively, sometimes we don't feel like that, and our emotions and feelings can be all over the place, but that never changes the objective truth of how God sees us and who we are as children of God because of the great Father's love for us. What a great reminder on this beautiful Friday morning of who we are. We are children of God. And then we continue. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. And so what we see is what's always going to be at odds is God and the world. And they're always going to be at odds with each other because this is not the world that God intended for you and for me. When He created everything, it was perfect. It was paradise. When sin entered into the world, the world has fallen now. It's turned upside down. And we live in a world of good and evil. And the world has been deceived by the one who brought sin into the world, and that is Satan himself. And because of that, the world is always going to have a gravitational pull away from God and its creator and the word of God. And so it's important for us to know that, that as followers of Jesus and children of God, we are always going to be going against the gravitational pull always going against the current in this fallen world and as fallen people to go against the current to stay strong in our faith and our relationship with Jesus because we are His children. We are not children of the devil. We are not children of the world. 
as believers in Christ Jesus, we are children of our Lord. And so it's important to know that the world is always going to see things differently because it's going to look through a worldview lens. But as followers of Jesus, you and I, we're going to see things through a biblical worldview because we know the truth. The truth has set us free. And that truth is Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Verse 2, beloved. We see that word over and over in 1 John. That's who the church is. That's who you and I are. We are children of God and we are loved. And so we are his beloved. We are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And so as children of God, you and I, simul justus epicotter, Luther calls it, we are same time sinner, same time saint. And so we see this war that goes on with us each and every day this war between the flesh and the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And the Holy Spirit is going to point us to Jesus, to the Word of God, and against the ways of the world. But our sinful flesh is always going to want to follow its own desires. And that's the battle that we see that Paul would talk about in Romans 7. The good I want to do, the good I ought to do, I do not do. But thanks be to God who sent us Jesus Christ, Paul would say. But that battle is going to continue to happen each and every day for us to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and follow Jesus until Jesus returns. When he returns, that sinful part of us will be gone. We will be fully redeemed, fully restored, and we will be perfect like Adam and Eve were first perfect in the garden before sin entered the world. And so when Christ appears, we long for that day when the sinful part of us is just totally, totally removed. And until that day, we continue to follow the Holy Spirit and go against our sinful flesh and against the ways of the world, knowing that one day we will be like the way that God sees us. God sees us perfect because we're covered with the blood and the righteousness of Jesus. But we know each and every day as followers of Jesus that we do sin, we do mess up. And we daily repent of those sins and we daily admit and confess and receive God's grace and forgiveness. But that day when he appears, then that sin is utterly removed and we'll live in a new heaven and a new earth where sin will no longer exist. And how we long for that day when that battle and that war is over. Even though we know it's already been won by Christ, we know it will ultimately be fulfilled when he returns. And so that's the reminder for the church today. Verse 3, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Important for us to remember when we see the word hope in scripture, it's different than the way that we think of hope in the world. Hope, we hope that we have good weather this weekend. We hope we have a good time with family. We hope that maybe we're going to go to the park or we hope that we're going to be out on the water. But we hope and that may or may not happen. Biblical hope is 100% certainty that the promises of God have been and will always be fulfilled. And so biblical hope is a declared status on the promises of God. It's 100% certain and sure. And so as we hope in Christ, we have the purity of Christ because we've been clothed with Christ. We're covered with Christ, his grace, his righteousness. Verse 4, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. And so practice. When you and I want to get good at something, we practice. We put the time in, the effort in, we invest, and we continue to practice to get better at that skill or at that trait. And what John is saying here is, is for the non-believer, they don't see what they are doing as wrong. They just see it as the ways of the world. That's all they know. And so they don't see that as lawlessness, the things that they do, the things that they think, the things that they say that go against the word of God. They just see that as normal. But as us as followers of Jesus, we see that differently. And we know we're held to this biblical standard. And this is the standard and the truth, and it never changes. And so we know that our sin always shows us our need for our Savior. And so SOS, we need help. We need saved. We need delivered. And the only place we can find forgiveness of our sins is in Jesus Christ. Verse 5, you know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no 
sin. That's the good news and the gospel that Jesus Christ knew of our sinful condition, came down from heaven, did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He saved us and delivered us through the cross. And through him taking our place, we have been saved. We've been set free because he was tempted in every way like you and me, but he never sinned. And he took our place and he took our punishment upon his shoulders. And by his wounds, we are healed. And that's the beautiful news of the gospel, the good news of what Jesus has done for us. Verse 6, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or know him. As children of God, we don't live with a cheap grace of, you know what, Jesus died for me. I can just go do whatever I want. I can just keep on sinning and just continue in the habit of certain sins. That's not what a believer thinks or does. A believer feels bad when they sin. They're sorry for their sins. They turn back to Jesus. They daily repent. They daily ask for forgiveness and grace. And they continually come back to Jesus, not just saying, hey, I can just do whatever I want and just continue to practice the habit of sin. There's a tension that lives in us as believers that that tension tells us when we mess up to come back to Jesus, to receive forgiveness and grace, and to strive to follow the Holy Spirit in our life. And we continue to fight that daily battle each and every day. For the person who's just practicing habitual sin, there is no more tension. Their conscience isn't eating them up anymore. They just continue to do wrong and no big deal. And for us as followers of Jesus, John is saying that is different. That's not how we view it. That grace is not cheap, that it came at a price. And that price was the precious body and blood of our Savior, Jesus. And because we are children of God, we are not our own. We've been adopted into God's family. We just don't go do whatever we want. Instead, we strive every day to follow the Holy Spirit and to follow Jesus and His Word. Verse 7, Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practiced righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. And so he's saying to the church, to the believers in Jesus, don't be deceived by this world. Don't be deceived by Satan. Don't be deceived by non-believers. Don't be deceived by false believers who just say they can do whatever they want. Continue to strive to follow the Word of God. And in the Word of God, we find the Word made flesh, Jesus. And His righteousness is our righteousness. What does righteousness mean? It means that we're made right with God. How are we made right with God? With what Jesus did for us on the cross. And now we have His Holy Spirit in us. And so we follow the way of the Spirit. We follow the way of truth, our conscience. Verse 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the very beginning. It's his essence, it's his nature. The nature and the essence and the character of Satan is to be oppositional defiant of God and of truth and everything that's right and to continue to go against God and to continue to sin and to bring other people into sin. Misery loves company and that's what's being said here. But for us as believers in Jesus, we don't practice sin and continue to do the habit of that sin over and over and over without repenting, without turning from it, without feeling sorry for from it, without giving up that tension that convicts us, that brings us back to Jesus, is what he's telling us here. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Why did Jesus come? To defeat Satan, to defeat sin, to defeat death, and to crush his enemy. And that's what he did on the cross. He defeated Satan, and that's the victory that we have. Verse 9, No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Again, he's reminding us that grace is not cheap. To not fall in the habit of just continuing to sin and not repenting from it, because that's not what we as believers do. As believers, we daily confess and repent for our sins. We are daily sorry for them. We daily turn back to Jesus. Born of God? We think of John chapter 3, Jesus teaching to Nicodemus at night. And he would say, one must be born again. And Nicodemus says, how can we be born again? I can't enter my mother's womb a second time. And he's saying, Nicodemus, you're thinking about physical birth. I'm talking about spiritual 
birth, spiritual rebirth, and that is being born again of the water and the spirit. For us as believers in Jesus, when were we born again of water and spirit? It was at our baptism. At our baptism, the old Adam, the old sinful self died and we were a new creation in Christ. And through the water and the spirit, we received the Holy Spirit of God who lives in us. And that is why we are children of God, because of God's grace and mercy of what he did for us in baptism. In baptism, God is active. We are passive. We're receiving forgiveness of sins. We're receiving grace. We're receiving the gift of being adopted into God's family. We're receiving the gift of being clothed in Christ's righteousness and being born again as a child of God. That word seed is a big word throughout Scripture. When Adam and Eve sinned, it was promised that a Messiah would come from the seed. The seed through Adam and Eve, all the way down through the tribe of Judah, through King David, the seed that would come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the way through David, is the seed that was born in Bethlehem, Jesus. And as Jesus is that seed, it's also important for us to remember that he uses the analogy of faith being like a seed in us, that it is born and that it grows and that it produces fruit. And that's what we see here. Verse 10, by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. How are we known as children of God? By our fruit, by the fruit of Christ that lives in us and that we bear fruit and that people see us striving to represent Jesus in how we live, how we act, in what we say, in how we think, in how we view the world, in how we view truth and grace through our Savior Jesus. And what's the action that the world should see from Christ Church is that we love because we have been loved by Jesus. And because he first loved us, we love him. And that's why we love others. Jesus even says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Doesn't mean we're always going to agree with people, especially when it goes against the word of God. It, but it, what it does mean is, is that we can still love them and show them love. And that's what's important for us as the church, to never compromise the word of God and his truth and his grace, but to always show love. And that even in difficult conversations, even where we disagree, what does the Bible say? Speak the truth in love. When they see us living a loving servant style of life because of what Jesus has done for us, then they're more likely to hear the good news of the gospel. And when they come to know Jesus, it is Jesus and the Holy Spirit who changes them like he changes you and me. That is the work of God in his Holy Spirit. Love and grace and truth is what changes and what transforms. And that is the gift of God for us as children of God. What beautiful verses and the word of God today for us to be able to spend that time with him in his word. And so let's bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, on this beautiful Friday, we are thankful for the gift of life, for the gift of creation, and most importantly, for the gift of your word and your word made flesh in our Savior, Jesus. Lord, we're thankful for his truth and for his grace and for his love and that we have been born again through the water and the spirit and the washing waters of holy baptism, that we have been adopted into your family, that we are forgiven, redeemed, and that we know about your grace and truth. Help us to go out today as children of God, that people would see the fruit that we bear in your name and that they would also know us and recognize us by the love of Christ Jesus that lives in us and through us. And all God's people said, Amen. We pray that you have a blessed weekend, and we will see you Sunday morning at church at 8, 9, and 1030. If you can't make it to church, join us online at 9 o'clock. There will be no Sunday evening service this Sunday because we have a different Sunday evening worship opportunity for you. If you love traditional worship, we invite you to come at 4.30 p.m. down in the worship center. They will be bringing in an organ. There'll be a festival choir as it's the North Wisconsin District Convention Worship Service. President of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, Pastor Matthew Harrison will be preaching. 
And so if you love a traditional festive service, come and attend down in the worship center at Mount Olive on Sunday at 4.30 p.m. And we pray God's blessings to be upon our convention that will be here in Wausau on Sunday evening and Monday. And we pray that God continues to bless His church that you and I are a part of as children of God. Have a blessed weekend in the powerful name of Jesus.